Okay. Um, so, can everybody hear me okay? Can everybody hear me too okay? Okay. Maybe the mic is up too high. Um, is it okay? Okay. Um, so, I am going to be talking about uh, big graph data science. And one of my first points that I want to make is that data is not flat. In particular, big data is not flat. Data is multimodal, multi-relational. There's all kinds of entities. There's all different kinds of relationships. There's spatiotemporal, multimedia. And so data is very rich and complex. And right now, a lot of the approaches to machine learning essentially take this originally graph data and somehow do something to it and turn it into a matrix. And I think what I'm going to say is like an interesting complement to what was said in the morning. When someone gives you a matrix, how do you get out the graph? But one of the points that I want to make is if you start off with a graph, remember that it was a graph and that you can use that in very interesting ways in doing the feature engineering in a smart way and so on. Um, so I personally think that we really need to move to both data science and machine learning methods that really can take into account this fundamentally, I'm going to call it graph structure, network structure element to the kind of world that we want to make predictions in and the kinds of worlds that we want to um, do our uh, good work in. And so uh, when you think about the Vs of uh, big data, so volume, velocity, and so on, I really think we need a new V. And this new V needs to capture this graphy kind of thing. And so I always ask, so anybody have a good V for graphs and networks? I like that one. <laughs> OK, so I was giving a talk at Penn State's uh, big social uh, science IGERT program. And you know the social scientist gave me a name, vinculate. So it turns out vinculate means the ties between things. So there really is a V that captures this. Um, so in this talk, what I want to go over is kind of at a high level, some of the pieces that I think are needed to go into this potential area of big graph data science and what kinds of things to look at. And I'm going to go through um, these things at a high level in a way that I hope is actually useful to you in your thinking about machine learning no matter what kind of mathematical tools you're using. But at the end, I'll talk about a tool very briefly, which is our favorite uh, hammer for doing this. And the first thing that I want to talk about is the kinds of patterns that I think are interesting to look at. I mean, obviously, we all know about things like uh, page rank and doing paths and graphs and so on. but. I'm very interested in the kinds of micro-level predictions that you can make on graphs. And I want to mention briefly some of these. I mean, some of these have already been mentioned in the morning. Um, but I think, again, these are like just little components that go into a, a bigger uh, problem. And so the first one is probably the easiest one. It's like, OK, you have a graph. You're trying to predict labels on the graph. Um, and let me start with an example. Uh, so this is a, a very US-centric example where we're talking about uh, inferring political parties where we have some sort of social network uh, with different kinds of relations. And the idea in this problem is that you're going to be given, potentially, a partially labeled graph. So you know some of the labels. And what you want to do is you have a collection of unknowns, and you want to infer those. So that's pattern number one, just labeling graphs, taking into account 
some labels and some structure. The next one is um, link prediction, which we've already heard mentioned a couple times this morning, so you guys all know this, predicting edges in a graph. But let me try and give an example that helps hopefully to highlight the richness of the kinds of things you can do. So you have different kinds of entities. So uh, think of the Enron uh, data set or any kind of uh, communication data set where you have both the individuals, you have the content, and you have some observed relationships. So you do have some observed graph, who communicates with who, um, who's co-located, uh, things like this. And then you're trying to do a link prediction problem, but the link prediction problem is not just the classic link completion problem. It's one where you're really trying to predict a different semantic link. So maybe what you're trying to do is predict who's the supervisor, who's the subordinate, who are colleagues. Um, and then the third, again, kind of micro, very basic kind of inference to making graphs is uh, entity resolution. So entity resolution is this idea of figuring out when two nodes are actually referring to the same underlying entity. Um, and one of the things that I find kind of hilarious about entity resolution is that entity resolution is such a ubiquitous problem in computer science that it goes by all of these different names and doing the entity resolution on what people mean by these terms is very interesting. And I'm always interested in kind of collecting more examples of these. So if you have some others that aren't listed here, uh, let me know. But I really want to emphasize how important this problem is. And here's a bit of a teeny tiny co-author fragment. So the nodes are authors and the links are co-authorship labels. And supposedly this data was extensively hand cleaned by domain experts and, you know, there's no issues in the data. Uh, but if you start looking at it, even for a little bit, you start seeing that there's actually, even in this little teeny portion of the larger data set, a huge number of issues. So if you look at the network before you did the entity resolution, versus after you do the entity resolution, you have completely different networks. And so think about the implications of this. Any of the stats that you compute on the before network are gonna be completely wrong. If you compute degree distribution, you compute average path length, or anything like this. Um, so I really like to emphasize to people that are dealing with graph data, you really need to think about your data and think about whether or not it has this issue because if it has this issue, you have the potential to get out uh, wildly inaccurate results. As a matter of fact, there's some very famous examples for exi about um, determining the fragility of the internet that basically underneath it, they were doing an incorrect resolution of the routers and the interfaces so that they said, like, oh, it's, it's so fragile. Well, if you actually understood the network topology, really, and did this correctly, you would not get out those results. Um, so as you can see, it's one of my uh, favorite problems. We've actually done a long tutorial on it. I'm not going to go into a lot more detail about it here, but uh, you can find it um, uh, from my website. So these are three, like, again, I think of them as, you know, graph analysis 101 micro problems. I personally really like the idea of how do you then do something where you do all of these at once? So I call that problem graph identification. You know, do the entity resolution, the link prediction, and the node labeling all at the same time. And the challenge is all of them are interdependent, and um, I'm going to talk about some tools that will help you with this at the end. But let me get to um, some key ideas. And like I said, I really hope that these key ideas are ideas that you can apply no matter what kind of modeling mathematical framework you end up, you know, is your favorite. And the first goes back to 
uh, feature construction, which is my um, picture from before. You know, most of the time, what we're doing in vanilla machine learning and data science is we take the graph, we flatten it, and we flatten it by creating uh, features, ideally, that take into account the graph structure. And doing this in a smart way is, as we all know, um, part of the art is feature engineering. I, I think it doesn't get the appreciation it deserves. I really wish we could kind of uh, get more uh, recognition of it and also get a, a better theory of it. And so within um, graph-based data science, bringing this up to first-class citizen where we really think about what is it that we know about the schema of the data so that we know something about what aggregates, what kind of structural measures make sense to include as features, um, when you're trying to do link prediction or when you're trying to do entity resolution, oftentimes the kinds of features you construct are over pairs of nodes. So you're doing like match features, you're doing structural similarity, neighborhood similarity, similarity of path. Um, and coming up with a kind of catalog of these is important. And then once you have these, then you can just take your flattened data and throw it into you know, whatever your favorite machine learning algorithm is. And this has certain advantages. Um, it is effective, usually you can pre-compute the features, so that's nice. Um, it's flexible and you can use, you know, your favorite open source toolkit for uh, handling this. But the cons are that particularly in graph structured data, you're really making incorrect independence assumptions. And so while I find that kind of doing this relational classifier where you flatten and construct features is a good baseline to start with and it's a good tool to have in your toolkit, being aware of the fact that there are these independence assumptions you're making and potentially if you made them more explicitly, you could do a better job. Um, and also, it's harder to impose global constraints and so on when, when you're doing basically each of these predictions independent pairwise across the whole graph. So that leads into actually the next point of, well, how do I model this dependence? And that uh, goes by the name collective reasoning. And let me, again, illustrate the idea of collective reasoning, but illustrate it in those three examples that we had before of node labeling, link prediction, and entity resolution. So in the node labeling example, um, so we're trying to predict the political party. Well, certainly we want to use all the information, all the local feature information we have for the individual. So, you know, maybe we know, you know, uh, what campaigns they contribute to so we can say something like, well, if they donate to a particular party, they're more likely to vote for that party. Uh, we can also have information about their status updates and their tweets and things like that. So we can say, okay, if they mention certain words or uh, phrases that have a particular political association, we use that to infer uh, what party they might be from. But then we want to look at the network structure. And so here again, we have some labels and then we have some unknowns and we can use the information about those labels to say something like, well, if my friend voted for a party, I'm more likely to vote for the party. Or, you know, if my spouse voted for a party, I'm more likely to vote for a party. And, you know, I'll tell you later the semantics of these, but for, of the weights. But in general, you can just say one feature is more uh, strongly um, associated with the class label. And then to do all of this in a collective way for our unknowns, we may infer, for example, uh, that this top person has, 
is a Democrat. And now, based on this, now when I infer this label, it should take into account not just the observed labels, but also the predicted label. So maybe I end up inferring this, and then end up inferring this. The key thing is that I want to do this jointly. So I have there three unknowns. So I want to have the joint probability of the set of labels, not having each label um, independently. So collective means being able to um, model that uh, distribution, that conditional distribution, but it's a conditional distribution of all the Ys given the Xs, not just an uh, individual Y given that particular individual instance's features. So for link prediction, again, the kinds of things you can do are things like, in this collective setting, start off by inferring the kinds of emails. So maybe there's two kinds of emails. There's deadline emails and there's social emails. Um, then based on the kinds of emails that someone sends, you can figure out, okay, if they send deadline emails, they're more likely to have this kind of relationship with someone. And then you can add in definitional kinds of constraints saying like, if someone's a supervisor of someone, um, uh, and that same person is a supervisor of someone else, then they're colleagues. So, so you can add in these, you can make them hard constraints or soft constraints, whatever makes sense. Then for the uh, final uh, example with entity resolution, here, if I'm trying to figure out if A and B are the same, I can look at the string similarity of the mentions, I can look at the overlap of their neighbors, and here's another place where you get this interesting collective thing happening because it's kind of recursive. If my friends are the same, if my friends and my friends are the same, and so on, and um, you get a dependency happening there in the resolution decisions. And also in the case where we have um, entity resolution, often you have a transitive closure kind of constraint. So there's a lot of different challenges in doing these inferences, but the point that I want to make is that predictions or the outputs are dependent on each other and we need to do joint reasoning to support this. And then let me say briefly something about scaling. Um, if we're trying to do link prediction or entity resolution, if we do it naively, uh, we're going to go from n uh, to n squared potential comparisons. Uh, this is really bad. In particular, um, even in this totally trivial case where you have a thousand businesses from a thousand different cities. Um, you, even if you can do comparisons really, really quickly, it's not going to work. So uh, if you use some blocking criteria to somehow reduce the number, then this ends up being tractable. And this you know, makes sense for a lot of different settings. So how exactly do we do this? What we want to do is look at the set of all possible edges, the matching pairs of nodes, figure out how to find the ones that satisfy some blocking criteria so that you reduce the number that you compare significantly. Now, how do you come up with these blocking criteria? There's two basic approaches. So one approach uses a hash function for doing this. Um, <laughs> And there's a variety of different approaches. People can come see me later or look at the tutorial for examples. Or clustering approaches where we look at, we allow things to belong to more than one bin, essentially. So these are some of the key ideas. Let me talk now about tools. And I'm going to do this very briefly. Uh, so we have a tool that we've been working on uh, for a while called probabilistic soft logic that is exactly suited for doing these kinds of predictions and graphs. And the key aspects of it is it's a declarative language for doing collective probabilistic inference problems where the random variables are continuous valued, um, the rules capture um, dependencies, 
and a PSL rule define our program is the model plus an input database it's going to define a joint distribution over all the y's and so an example is what I've been showing you so far these kind of rules the foundations for this are in order to make this actually be tractable we're going to map those logical rules to convex functions and there's three different principles that justify this but essentially saying this in one sentence we're going to define some distance to satisfaction that's going to be the loss for every single rule we're going to put this into a giant Markov random field where this loss function is defined by these rules and the very cool thing about this is it ends up being convex so no sampling to solve it you can do direct optimization uh, so the direct optimization is really fast we can do a distributed approach which is even faster we have a you know basic implementation based on graph lab and ADMM uh, it outperforms discrete MRFs um, significantly in speed and it's flexible so we've applied it to a lot of different problems and we're very much interested in more because we want to understand how well this works um, so for more information normally I give an hour-long talk on this at least uh, there's some videos here the, it's open source so you can download it so to conclude um, I really think we do need data science for graphs and what I said was just kind of little hints at pieces of it I think there's a fundamental opportunity to develop new theory for this uh, we're just touching on you know there's so much classic statistics based on having a random IID sample how do we deal with this heterogeneous case where you have all kinds of different biases and so on um, some important things that I didn't talk about but I was very happy to see are going to be talked about in the program are generative models causal models and so on um, privacy is really important users are really important um, and I think there's a lot of exciting things that we can do in a lot of different domains so thanks <laughs>